Welcome back, everyone. This next panel brings together people who are focused on how we ensure systems work to protect and prevent harm to children, as well as ensuring their voices are heard in the implementation of Te Aure Kura. The panel will be moderated by someone well known to all of you, Marin Lawler from the National Network of Family Violence Services. Marin, over to you. Yeah, there you go, Marin. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're coming to the sort of final um, session um, of uh, this first uh, day of the hui. Um, and it seems fitting that at, at some level this morning we started with um, somebody talking about the importance of hearing from the children. Um, where are the children? And that it seems fitting as we come to the the, the end or almost the end of the, the first day that we are really now focusing in on the children. So this session is going to be slightly different to the um, sessions that have been run this morning. Um, we are joined by four leaders who are focused on the well-being of children and young people within the family violence and sexual violence systems. And we all know that um, achieving intergenerational change requires that we prevent harm to children, but that we also support parents because they are the uh, caregivers, um, the, the, the nurturers of children who are undergoing significant physical, mental and emotional development. Um, they are especially vulnerable to the impacts of violence and they are rarely heard. So we have, um, we're, I'm very pleased to be joined by four leaders um, in, in the, uh, the field, our panellists are, and um, because we want to get them talking, we, we're short-circuiting introductions. Um, we're joined by the Children's Commissioner, Judge Evers, um, by Catherine McPhillips, the Executive Director of Auckland Sexual um, Abuse Help, uh, Dr. Tuwila Percival, a uh, paediatrician and researcher with Mo um, Moana Research, and of course, Dr. Kim McGregor, the Chief um, Victims Advisor. Um, what we have done throughout today is invite you to post questions in the chat. And we've got a series of questions now, which I'm going to pose to the uh, panelists and invite them to make comment. Um, because we only get um, what is effectively 20 to 30 minutes to do this, um, and we have a lot of questions, um, I don't necessarily want to say you've got about two minutes to give your response to a question, but you've got about two minutes to give your response to a question. Um, but what I did want to do, rather than um, just invite two people to respond to the first question, is to invite each of you to respond to um, this first question, um, which is how do you think the voices of children and young people can be safe, safely and ethically included in the implementation of Te Aurere Kura. And I will invite Judge Evers to um, begin. Here I go, I'm going live. Oh, yep. Uh, sorry, Marin. apologies for that. We've just had some feedback come through from our uh, disabilities audience who have kindly asked if we could all, uh, as we speak, just slow down a little so that it's easier for our interpreter to be able to convey uh, your cordial. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I will hand over to Judge Evers and the question is, how can the voice of children and young people be safely and ethically included in the implementation of Te Aurere Kura? Uh, tēnā koe, Mirren. Can you hear me? Uh, tēnā koutou. Um, uh, 
the panelists, um, tēnā koe i te minuta, um, um, and tēnā koe te katoa um, to all of you who are listening out there today. Uh, yes, I'm Frances Evers, uh, I'm the Children's Commissioner, I'm uh, Ngāti Mani o Poto and Waikato, uh, but I grew up in an awesome place called Te Teko, which some of you may know of, um, and my proudest achievement is that I have three sons. So um, just quickly, on, in answer to that question, it's a big question, <laughs> um, Merin, and one that certainly my office grapples with. Um, it's extremely important that any um, information obtained from our mokopuna is done in the proper way. And um, in preparing for this panel today, in fact, that was one of the things that um, uh, Peter Fawaisi, who um, works very, very uh, closely in this area of obtaining children's voices in our My World team, um, is uh, very conscious of, and in fact, um, ending family violence and hurting families heal is one of our priorities. Uh, and this was the first question that came to mind. How do we get this information from our mokopuna, um, not only ethically, but in a way that um, doesn't in in increase their mamai, their pain, uh, and what we've done um, in, our, in our work across the last five years in, in, in getting children's voices is not ever done, it's never been a specific uh, kaupapa, but some of that information has come out when we've spoken to children. So I personally believe, I mean, certainly my office is presently working on that very question. I can't give you that answer today uh, because I think we're going to have to rely on good research um, that make sure, as I say, particularly that our, our mokopuna feel safe uh, when they're talking, um, that uh, all of the uh, right uh, steps are made to ensure that, and not only um, gaining that information, but how we use that um, information um, to, help our mokopuna, to help our mokopuna. So, uh, as I say, we've, we've had various um, information over the years, but certainly, um, I can't answer that question, but it's key to getting the right information and also ensuring that these children who are exceptionally vulnerable, might I say, um, are protected. Kia ora. Catherine, if I might pass over to you. Uh, thanks, Maren. Um, and yes, warm greetings to everybody and thanks for the opportunity to talk with you today. So um, I, the perspectives that I bring are, you know, um, in terms of service users. So I'm a clinical psychologist and, and run crisis and therapy services and a leadership program for young people and prevention program for little E's and their families. So three to five year olds. So that's the perspective I bring to answer this question. Um, starting with young people, I think that one of the things that I'm struck by is young people are yelling already. Young people are already telling us what they want in this space. We've had a number of marches over the past few years, for example, uh, led by high school students saying they want compulsory consent education in high school. So, you know, for me, that's yelling and it, it's up to us. We know we're going to listen to that because um, they've told us very clearly. Um, we also have a young person who uh, has been in the youth parliament and, uh, you know, her speech last week was about the need to reform consent law on the grounds of, you know, the lack of an affirmative definition, if you like, uh, of consent. Um, and she's got a petition up on the parliamentary website. So she's a first year uni student, started this work when she was in high school. Um, so, so, you know, I think that young people are, are yelling loudly about what they want, or some young people. Um, I also think that young people who are in therapy or counselling following sexual violence are also a group that we need to think about very seriously. Um, and I, part of that kind of healing process often for many people is to create change in the world, is, is to, uh, helps to give meaning to the experience that they went through if they can contribute to other people not having to go what they went through. And so I think that finding a way to bring uh, the framework of Te Aurea to those young people um, so that they can see that they're, they're not just not alone in terms of themselves, their whānau and, you know, the therapeutic process, but also that the world, oh, oh sorry, our world, um, is looking at this to do better by them. And so I think bringing that framework to them and with an opt-in opportunity, you know, that if they want to be involved in, in giving information, that we make those opportunities available to them because these are some of the young people who have been most impacted by this, who have thought about it the most 
you know, and, and want, um, many of them will want to be part of seeing change made. I think with children, um, you know, 12 and under, it, it's different again, and we need several strategies probably across several different age groups in that, that group, you know, 12 and under. But I do think that for the younger children, you know, really, um, they often tell us what they need and what they want by their behaviour. So things like when we go into preschool centres and run kind of drama education around personal safety, the children just love it. They lap it up. And I know this not th just through what my staff tell me, but they, they draw us pictures, they write cards, they send us things, they ask us to their birthday parties. They, you know, they just love this. And the feedback from the preschool centres is there's an immediate uptake of this. They're out there in the playground going, stop that, I don't like it, you know, and pushing back on any kind of bullying or inappropriate touch, you know, they immediately pick this up. And so that they, they vote with their feet, if you like, they implement it straight away, they do it. So I think that's one of the behaviours we have to kind of look at is children, children want this, they're telling us that. The other place I think that we're not often listening to children's voices or sometimes not listening um, is in uh, family court processes, for example, where there's custodial issues. So, you know, the children I see probably are those children for whom the system hasn't worked rather than those for whom the children works. And it may well be that those processes work for many children, but it's a disaster for the children it doesn't work with. And it's a disaster that they're not heard. So for example, children who've been sexually abused, who disclose that, who say they do not want to be left with uh, a parent who may have sexually abused them um, and then are forced by the system to spend time with that parent when they feel unsafe. And I think that the system really needs to get that, that, that children's right to voice that we want to bring. We need to bring that in every space in our system, not just where it's convenient for adults, that we need to allow children's voice to be heard wherever they bring it. Sure, Catherine. Um, <laughs> Um, Tuila. <laughs> Thank you. So um, just quickly about me, I'm a, a general paediatrician and I work in many areas, including in emergency department and in clinics. And um, I, I also see a number of children who've been through care and protection. And I guess um, for me, what's essential is that we consider and think about the diversity of children when we're thinking about their voices. So often the children that do get missed out are the very young ones, of course, and you can still talk in a really sensible way to a six-year-old, um, but also the children with disability, the children with learning difficulties, the, the children who are so traumatised they have having difficulty engaging with professionals and services, and, and it always concerns me that the children we most need to hear from, we don't hear from. Um, you know, a, a child who's got a, a learning disability, we can still hear from them. They've still got a, a really good thing and a story to tell us. Um, the other thing is there's a great depth of information coming out of the Royal Commission, which is telling this, us the story of survivors who've been through childhood. And there's some wonderful, wonderful um, guidance there for us. I think that echoes with this with this wonderful strategy. Um, the other thing I just want to echo that what the points already made, which is when we when we engage with children and talk with them, they need to know that what they say is important, that we think they're important, and what they say is valuable. And the other thing I'd suggest is um, if we get children and young people to design the stuff they're probably going to come up with a really good way of talking to one another, you know, and it'll be some clever IT platform thing we've never heard of, you know, probably. So I would always get children to come and design it for us. You know, how do we do this engagement? Well, let's ask them because seven and eight year olds probably know more than we do about how to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And um, Dr. Kim. Ah, oh, Kirikoto, Fano, um, and uh, um, just a 
quick pipi ha ko Glenline to Monga ko Lok Tata Awa ko McGregor to we ko McGregor to ko Ingwa. And I just like to mihi to Minister Davidson. Um, uh, this is a fantastic day to have us all here together, um, and so many hundreds of advocates and so many people I've worked alongside for decades. So it's a, it's a, a fantastic day. Um, on the topic of um, hearing safely and ethically from children, I, I would agree from all of my um, colleagues, panelists, speakers, that children, they want to be heard. They are already speaking out through the, through the Royal Commission, um, through uh, children's services. They're calling Youthline, they're calling um, all, all of our services, they're asking for help. Uh, we just need to hear them. Um, I, my particular area of concern is for children going through justice services. And uh, for any of you who are interested, um, I have a Chief Victims Advisor website. And on that website, um, there are at least two uh, reports on uh, child witnesses and, and their needs. Um, the first one talks about the delay for children, so they have to wait you know, sometimes uh, a quarter of their lives um, to get to court because they are so young um, and they're not allowed to talk to other people um, uh, while they're waiting to go to court. So their lives are on hold and our criminal justice system seems to harm them even more. And so it's, it's very hard for us to um, be able to uh, support children well when we've got an adversarial system where we're making them testify against people that often that they love um, who have harmed them and it, it's a it's such a such a harsh brutal court system it's an adult court system that we are asking children to step into um, I believe that we need a, um, a specialist court support service for children throughout the country the second report uh, on my uh, on my website um, is called That's a Lie, um, written by Isabel, Dr. Isabel Randall. And it talks about children going through court, feeling like they've been called liars over and over again. So I think we need to hear from children. And we have actually, um, there are some reports by uh, the Gravitas uh, Agency on children going through court. And uh, Dr. Fred Seymour and Isabel Randall have written a lot about the needs of, of children and, um, and their whānau going through court. So. Um, I'd, I'd like us to be able to listen, um, but also to tailor our uh, surveys and um, yeah, and just just uh, hear the voices of children. Uh, Kākite, thank you. Sure. Um, I, the next question relates very much to um, um, the the fact that children, um, you know, often in the care of uh, the Ministry of Education for significant periods of their week. Um, and while the Ministry of Education is part of Te Puna Ao Nui, um, this is a question about what you think needs to be done to enable schools to be more responsive to children and young people who are affected by uh, by violence. So, and Catherine, I'm going to throw that to you initially. Thanks, Marin. Uh Yes, what a big question. <laughs> so much to uh, be done in that space. And um, so, you know, it is um, many years now that we've been asking for schools to have uh, training, for schools to have adequate policies, um, we provide services, um, counselling services in local high schools. Most of those schools have a policy which ticks the box that they're required to have, but it doesn't deal at all with the abuse that most young people um, are experiencing. So what we know from some of the previous uh, Youth 2000 surveys is 70% of the sexual violence that young people experience is from each other. It's peer, you know, and so often those policies are telling teachers how to recognise um, a person who's coming to school who might be being abused by a person outside or how to deal with it if, if an allegation is made against a teacher. So, you know, we need the education framework to um, update itself to, to what the nature of the abuse is that's happening, um, to look at, you know, what schools really need to do. So schools are in really difficult positions because often this uh, sexual violence among peers 
it, it's born of the school community, if you like, because that's how young people know each other and its impacts play out in the school community because schools becomes a very difficult place for people. But often it's happened off the school site or if it was on the school site, it was out of hours, it was Saturday night or something like that. So schools have dilemmas like that. They have dilemmas like, well, if somebody's made a police report, what can then the school do? You know, they've got this dilemma, they need to provide education to everybody. So we need to work through with Ministry of Education, we need to work through all of these dilemmas that schools face so that they can actually provide safe places for young people. Because one of the things we see constantly is girls leaving high school. Like, you know, some of them move, but most of them just leave, to be honest, because they can't be got safe in that school environment. And by got safe, I don't mean that, um, you know, they're not safe from somebody sexually abusing them again, but it's that need to really understand the impacts of trauma. When you're traumatised, you can't be in that space with that person, even if they are going to keep their hands in their pockets and their penis and their pants you know it's like you need to be psychologically safe and we haven't set schools up in ways that they can actually provide that safety so you know the invitation from me would be to the Ministry of Education to please engage with the sector so that we can work with you um, to get these things in place. We've got a syllabus review, I think, happening in 2024, but, you know, consent education is being pulled out at the end of this year. We've got a massive gap coming up. You know, we're really not supporting schools. This is absolutely urgent work. We talk about how COVID has derailed this generation of young people, but, you know, we're abandoning them in the face of sexual violence now. We've got to do better. Kia ora. I'm wondering if I could um, pose this question to um, Judge Evers, and it's it's a huge question, um, which is what do we need to do now to ensure that children who are in state care are protected from abuse? And that's both the abuse um, that might occur as a result of wherever they are placed, but also the abuse of the system itself. How do we protect those children? It's not just a huge question. That's like, <laughs> I, I don't know. How many days have we got? <laughs> um, can I just quickly say that I completely agree with um, Catherine, um, just quickly. Um, I've actually thought long and hard about that question, if I might, Catherine, because I don't see it actually as just solely an issue for Ministry of Education. It's also health. This should be a collaboration between education and health. Teachers are there to teach. Health needs to be in the education space and that support needs to be in all schools. Consent's a major issue for our kids because if adults aren't talking to them about it, how do they learn? The internet and it's not working. It's really hard. So I see that as a huge issue for health um, and education and health need a collaboration on that. So just going back to my own very, very, very hard question. Um, look, Right now, children being safe in state care, right now, if I had my way, if I could, can I can I reply that by saying if I had a magic wand, um, I would debureaucratize um, our state care system um, and I would put it back into our communities, our communities know um, which of our, our children um, and I'm not just talking about our communities, I'm talking about the agency. So say like, you know, I grew up near Whakatane. So in Whakatane, you know, we knew which families were struggling, which families needed help. Um, the teachers knew, the police knew, um, lawyers knew, uh, people next door knew. And I would like to see um, a, a friend of, of mine who's um, a, a family court judge and I have a dream um, that we won't be needed in care and protection courts in the future. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see our mokopuna not going into state care. I'd like to see extreme intense wraparound services going into whānau in, in communities, um, really good support for our social workers, good training, uh, really a, a collaboration between all of the government agencies and non-government agencies and our iwi within communities um, to help those of our whānau that we know are struggling in a dignified way in a way that gives them, um, you know, whakamana tangata, that report, and underlining it all often is is poverty. Uh, but I would like to not see our kids going into state care. So, you know, I mean, so many times as a lawyer and a judge, I read reports where, I don't know, it seemed to be boys. Um, they'd take little boys away at age eight. I remember one particular story that just like 
almost stabbed, actually stabbed me in the heart. Um, a little man who was picked up at school by his social worker. She was just doing her job, put her in the put him in the car and said, you can't go home tonight, it's not safe. And it wasn't safe. But he was completely bamboozled, didn't know what was happening, didn't see his whanau for a long, long time. And I know that that's, for me, was always a frustration in the process. You know, the processes take so long to do. There's so much bureaucracy. Uh, kids are, you know, being placed with strangers who they've got no connection to. And just that sort of intense feeling of loneliness, desperation, um, you know, lack of, of of love in many instances. I mean, let, let's let take um, um, Te Ehorangi's in um, the paper today. And, you know, he talks about his experiences in and out of um, state care. Some of them were good and some of them were really bad. No child should have to go through that. And I think instead of thinking about taking children away, it still has to happen. I, I'm not saying it shouldn't. But, you know, let's work towards a model. Let's plan for a model where it's only extreme cases that that's needed, that it's based in communities with, with just guidance from the top and that that's where our money goes to and that's where our resource and energy goes to. So that's my pipe dream. That's my magic wand. I hope that answered it, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora. And, and I, I have to say it's probably the most difficult question um, that we have, but it is one that has filtered through the chats today. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the the inquiry into state care that's been um, occurring and the anxiety that, that the abuses that we were seeing all those years ago are abuses that are continuing today. Um, we wish we could confer that magic wand as part of your role um, to, to make that change happen immediately. Um, you raised an issue, Judge Evers, which um, touches, I think, of, upon a question um, that was posed that I'd actually like to um, throw to um, Tuila, and it's about what do we need to provide um, in terms to parents to be able to nurture their children peacefully and positively? And are we in a position to provide that at the moment? Um, that's another big question, and I guess I I come from the point of view that um, children are always in families, and children cannot thrive or develop unless we have the right carers around them and parents who are resourced and feel able and capable to to bring their their kids up and assist the, their development. And um, when I when I see parents and families, you know, I've been doing this job for decades and I've seen all kinds of children including severely abused children including children who've been killed and I've yet to meet a parent that didn't love their child you know seriously I've yet to meet a parent that didn't love their child and what gets in the way is all the stuff you know the the parents abuse you know the poverty the drug and alcohol um, so I think the love and the intention are probably there and and what we focus on I guess is I think parents need real practical help so there's no point sitting down doing a parenting course if you're going back to a one bedroom flat with five other people and you've got no money in your house you know I think we need to first of all do what we can to value the job of being a parent and reduce the stress of not having enough stuff to, to be able to look after your kids um, and, you know, I think uh, probably the health system and our, our sort of everyday oh. universal health system is available to do support for parents, but we don't tend to do that. We tend to focus on measuring and doing checks and filling out lists, and um, we don't build a relationship with families and spend time walking the journey with them and supporting them and, you know, um, celebrating the strengths that, that, that parents have and then helping them with difficulties that they have. So I'm a, a person who's in favour of um, reorientating a lot of what we do in health so that it's relationship-based instead of um, context and um, list-based. And we could do a lot to help parents if, if we had that universal, simple, easy-to-access system. I have... Um, 
also a, a great, uh, I guess, belief in building a village around babies and, and parents. So um, having a village of extended family and neighbours and, and valuing that and really celebrating and pushing the need to build a village around children and their parents. And, you know, that's what will really support them when you've got grandmother and auntie and next door neighbour. So it, it goes to the community, really, not so much um, getting people into parenting courses, but, you know, the, the help is there. We just need to change the way we prioritise things and really, really value the job of being a parent. I hope that answered it. Absolutely. I'm just wanting to invite um, any of the panellists who also might want to speak into that space of what we can do to support parents um, to um, be the best that they can be in terms of nurturing children and whether any other panellists would like to add to that corridor. I guess from the sexual abuse perspective, totally, uh, you know, uh, support what Dr. Twila was talking about. But um, but we also need parents to be able to protect their children from uh, sexual abuse perpetrated by people. Uh, you know, sometimes it's within the family, but sometimes it's people who are close to the family, but outside the family. So, you know, when we talk with parents about um, you know, how to spot a sex offender, which, you know, I say laughingly because that's what people want to know. They're like, well, how do I tell? You know, how do I tell? And they're looking for some kind of physical characteristic. You know, are their eyes too close together or are their nose, nose bent to one side? You know, and when we say, well, actually, no, it's the subtle things in behaviour that you need to look at, you know, people are kind of gobsmacked that actually, ah, actually, I can look at those things. I, you know, if somebody is offering to take the neighbourhood children away overnight and, you know, does that often, well, that is something to be looking at. And, and it is okay for us to say no. It is okay for us to say, look, thanks very much, but no. Um, you know, so I think really being able to have these conversations with parents early on and teach them the ways to talk to their kids about personal safety. You know, that's one of the things that came out of research we did around our program was that the parents were like, oh, thanks. Now I know what to say. It's easy. So all the angst went out of it. And what I love about that is if a family is not angsting about you know, sexual abuse, then kids can tell because sometimes they'll try and disclose, but everybody gets so upset and don't know what they're talking about that, you know, they shut down. So if we could have families all over this country who knew how to talk about this, who knew how to listen to their kids and hear it, and were able to do that because they knew what to do then, they knew how to protect their kids, you know, that would be a revolution. Kia ora. And Judge Evers, did you want to add something there? Uh, yes, I just wanted to say... Um that I, I'd add all of what um, Dr. Percival said to my magic wand. Uh, it's really, I really so important, but I just, just actually went, went out my team, they have picked up some of the children's voices as they've done other work. And there were two things that sort of came out of what Dr. Percival said. One was that um, some mentioned that their, their, their family, their parents fight when they are stressed. So that's that issue about, they don't have the stuff to be the job of, of being a good parent. And another one, which I think is really key to help me you need to help my whānau. And uh, I think that, you know, that just comes back to that supporting whānau, not judging them, but supporting them. And so good, that message of valuing the job of parenting. It's actually the most important job in the world, to be honest. Kia ora. Um, we have um, an, another question that I think at various levels, each of you have touched upon in terms of um, the notion of how we hear children. Um, but it's focusing in on the family violence workforce and the sexual violence workforce and whether they have the skills and the resources to be able to adequately hear the voices of children. So this isn't so much about how do we hear children, it's about whether there's a, a, a lack of skills um, or a lack of resources. And I, I'd invite each of the panellists to make some observations about that, but also perhaps identifying where the greatest need might be. So it might be a particular part of the workforce that needs to um, have some upskilling or some resourcing. Um, 
And I might start with you, um, Dr. Kim. <laughs> uh, kia ora koutou. Um, yes, I was thinking about uh, organisations that in the past have had child advocates and then lost the funding for that. And that what a, what a devastating uh, point that was. Um, I, I would love to see our family violence and sexual violence um, workforce being having the specialist training to deal with children in um, in fi family dynamics, um, and for for that those workers to have funding to be there to be able to advocate for children within the system, that would be my wish. Sure. sure. Uh, anyone else? Um, yeah, I guess in the sexual violence space, our desperate need is for more staff who can work with children. I can think of areas across the country where there are no specialist child counsellors following sexual abuse, you know, whole areas. Um, there's just none because there's nobody to employ. Um, we're not training enough, um, you know, counsellors, psychologists, et cetera, to work specifically with the children. Um, and we are failing, you know, when I trained decades ago, we all got taught about child sexual abuse in our training. That's not happening anymore. We end up with graduates who, you know, out of counselling programmes who aren't even taught about trauma, let alone violence and abuse. So really, um, if we could get our tertiary training programs teaching this, you know, the basic of it, then agencies like the one I work with, you know, we could then take people and train them up, you know, more specifically to get to that expert level. But when we're needing to train from the very beginning, you know, it's too much. We can't do that. And, and people aren't interested in coming into the work because they've never been exposed to it. So really, if we could find a way to get that into the training system, uh, that would be really, really helpful. So I don't mean to jump in again, but I was just um, thinking about a conversation I had with uh, my colleague, Dr. Janet Farnslow, who was talking about the need for training teachers about child sexual abuse, about family violence, so that they can um, understand uh, dynamics and be able to refer on well. So I think that's, that's a really important workforce to provide those skills to. Sure. Can, um... Can I just say that my, my thoughts on this are that uh, it, it also needs that we know we know there's a shortage and I'm really surprised, um, Catherine, to hear that people aren't being trained in that. That's that's actually quite shocking. Um, but I guess if I look at it from a, a very broad perspective, and you know, it's 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 a it's a combination of having our trauma specialists and psychologists and counsellors, but also um, as Dr. Percival was talking about, building relationships as well within community, because that's part of, I think someone mentioned before that, you know, often, um, I think you did Dr. McGregor, um, about, you know, young people are having to give evidence about people that actually they love. Um, and, and you said, um, Dr. Percival, that, you know, most people love their children, they just, they just can't cope or there's reasons why they're not coping and doing the job. So it's a, I see it as a combination of not just our specialists and our counsellors, but also in combination with building those communities around them. As, as Dr. Percival said, no good going to a counselling session and then go, or parenting programme and then going back to your one bedroom flat with your flatmates and not having enough to give your kids um, time, energy or, 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 or money. And also, um, our, you know, the other hole or gap is that the counselling needs to be culturally appropriate. So, um, and people need to be able to identify, you know, with their own, and that's a big gap as well. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd perhaps add is, is just to reinforce the, the need for cultural appropriateness. And, you know, we do need more Māori and Pacific um, to train and be upskilled in, in this area. And the other group that I come across that's a big, I struggle to find anyone to help with other, other, again, young people with learning disability and, you know, who is out there who can really work with them um, and parents with learning disability who've got children, you know, so that's another, another area and, and um, a bit of a worry for me because it is quite common. So um, I don't know, our workforce doesn't seem to be moving to address that much. 
Um, we are coming towards the end of, of this session, um, but one of the things that I was struck by was uh, Judge Eve was talking about if I had a magic wand. Um, so I'm going to go around and give you each a magic wand. Um, you only get to wave it once and you only get to do one thing with it, one very practical thing with it that will improve the lives of children um, who are currently facing um, family violence or sexual violence and are in unsafe spaces. Um, so I, I give you this magic wand, one thing that you would change overnight with that magic wand. Um, and I might um, actually start with Dr. Kim. <laughs> Kira, um, yes, I would like uh, with my magic wand that if a child says that they are unsafe, that they are made safe and they are not made to go through the family court or through the um, adversarial criminal justice system, that they are made safe and then we find ways of finding out um, without involving the child, having to be a witness, um, what's going on. And we as adults make sure that those adults around the children or whoever's hurting them stop it <laughs> and get the help they need um, to, to, to make them safe. And that's my ma magic wand request. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Dr. Twilla. Um, if, um, I guess what I would like to see is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the others are going to talk about stuff for children, is whatever happens for children, we're doing what we need to for children. I'd like us not to forget that there's a family around that child and that that family might need work and counselling and support and, and to not forget that for, for that child, that family always their family. Mum and dad are always their mum and dad, no matter what they've done, they are still their mum and dad and children still will identify with that mum and dad and family. So I, I would like us not to forget that there's a family that need help as well. Kia ora. Catherine. Kia ora. Um, mine is similar to Kim's, but I'd frame it slightly differently in the sense that uh, for me, yes, our, all of our formal systems put children through things that are created for adults and the rights of adults take precedence. So I would rather we yeah, uh, took disclosures if they were credible, that we act on those disclosures and protect the child first, but that the whole system becomes centered around putting the child's rights above the rights of adults, that the child is in the center of those that system and that the system is, is restorative. Um, so we need to move to a therapeutic um, model you know so we see things like in the family court um you know there might be some temporary separation but then it's like oh well we'll gradually expose this child to this person who hurt them then it'll be all right well no <laughs> actually the people who do the hurting need some treatment first and some support and the whole family needs that wrap around over years to get that whole family back functioning properly because certainly with sexual abuse the dynamics in the family get so distorted by that 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 you know so so it's not like some uh that nothing's just a decision. You know, we get things like probation. People are not eligible for community treatment when they've sexually abused children because they go, oh, well, they've only abused their own children. It's like, well, <laughs> it's like, what does that mean? It's like, no, there needs to be a wraparound process that restores family dynamics, that recognises the risk across generations because, you know, lots of people don't actually disclose to their adults because they then have a child or their sibling has a child and like, don't want my dad to do this to, you know, the grandchild. It's like... You know, so we really need to take the long view, put the kids in the centre, wrap the families around them and wrap the, the rehab, the treatment, the, all the support around the family. Kia ora. And finally, Judge Evers, you get another magic wand. <laughs> well, because it's magic, I would like to reprogram how we think. So uh, that's what I'll do with my magic wand. He taonga. If every single person in this country looked on their child as a tonga, as a precious gift, um, mm. I think our jobs would be redundant, and that would be what I would want with my magic wand. And every what all of what all of my uh, 
panel, the panelists that are with me today have said just now, um, it's wrapping it all up into that. So uh, yeah, our kids need to be safe and they need to be loved. And we need to make sure that the adults that are charged with that have the support to do it. And they need to remember what an important job this is as a parent. Kia ora. I want to thank our panellists and um, acknowledge and, and recognise your commitment to um, our, our children and young people and um, being their voice in a system that sometimes doesn't allow them to have a voice. Um, but in closing, to come back to the message um, that we heard from you, which is the children are already screaming they're already yelling and telling us what we need to hear we need to open our ears and listen and i'll throw back to our mcs Kia ora, thank you so much for facilitating what was a really really informative session with our guest panelists there um, and to throw them a question such as what would you do with the magic wand overnight if you had it um, so good to hear those answers from a learned, uh, passionate group such as that one. So many thanks to you, Merrin.